Chapter 26, you're going to notice we're going to actually discuss some of the meds we just discussed in 25, so it'll just be a little bit of a review uh, because we're doing non-opioid, which include like our NSAIDs and acetaminophen and all that sort of stuff, and then we're doing opioid analgesics, so which are pain medications. Uh, so let's go into this. So, you know, nursing is actually having this big debate right now about the fifth vital sign being pain, okay? So, you know, we still talk in those terms, but there's a lot of research out there currently that's being done, and you can search it on your own time if you want, about um, pain, like this whole opioid epidemic that we're having, and obviously in the place where I work, um, I will be more sensitive to it, but that we may have caused some of this with pain being the fifth vital sign. But as of today, pain is whatever the patient says it is okay uh we don't know what the patient's going through and my my five and another patient's five could be very different depending on somebody's pain tolerance um especially in times of illness and surgery and things of that nature so um as of today pain is what the patient tells me it is okay as we've been talking about in class it's not our place to really judge this and decide what somebody else's pain is and um, again, the whole, the patient is drug seeking. Uh, we, we don't want to participate in that because that just helps, um, or not helps, but that um, contributes to our own job dissatisfaction, honestly, you know, um, our own mental well-being and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, I don't know what one person's pain is for, for versus another. Everybody has different tolerance. You can see up there, um, up to 75% of patients have unrelieved pain. Um, and then, so then you have lists here. I've listed out everything for different things that um, can happen for under treatment and for unrelieved pain. Notice in there, um, the nurse's inability to measure pain is a reason for under treatment, okay? Um, and then inaccurate knowledge of addiction and tolerance, right? Tolerance being, we uh, kind of discussed this the other day, tolerance versus tachyphylaxis. You're definitely gonna wanna know those. So you've got a uh, video here that you can watch. Um, this one right here, I'm not like mandating it, There's, it's, but it would be helpful if you wanna understand more of the gate theory, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go into that all that much. I'm not gonna ask you specifically on that, but you can watch that if you want. Um, types of pain on page 354, um, the types and the best meds for it. So you definitely wanna go through those and know what those different types of pain are, okay? Um, they're all listed there for you. You can look those up very easily. Um, and then analgesics, this is how we treat pain with medications. So either with opioid or with non-opioid medications. So non-opioid include things like aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, um, the things that we just talked about. So they're usually um, over the counter or we um, have the NSAIDs, uh, most of them which you can actually get over the, the, over the counter. Um, and you can see I listed out there effective for what kinds of pain, right? Throbbing pain of headaches, uh, dysmenorrhea, inflammation, minor abrasions. So you have different things that it can, it, that these can help. Um, there's your list of NSAIDs, which we just covered. Uh, we just talked about aspirin. Again, that's going to be the one that you're going to do as a separate, um, as a salicylate NSAID because it is much different and it's an antiplatelet. Uh, so you're going to end up having that for that part as well. You're going to want that, and you're going to see it again in the future. Um, acetaminophen, this is not an NSAID, though we discussed it, and that video you guys watched also talked about it in there, even though it's not an NSAID, okay? Um, this is going to inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. Um, we, we use it to relieve pain. We use it for fever. Um, you know, it can, be, it can be toxic to the liver, so we have to watch um, that sort of thing, and we do know that patients can overdose on that. So um, mucamist is actually the medication that is an antidote for that. It's important that we know that, especially if you end up like in an ER or someplace where we're taking care of patients that have overdosed. Um, the rest of that you can read on your own. So we're going to talk about opioid analgesics now. So um, we have opioid agonist. So this means they are going to assist. Remember, agonist is helping with, antagonist is blocking. So those are the difference between those words. Uh, we use opioid analgesics for moderate and severe pain. Um, they suppress pain and pulses as well as respiratory and cough, coughing by acting on the respiratory and cough centers in the medulla of the brain stem, okay? 
Um, many opioids also possess anti-diarrheal effects. There's actually one called Lamotil that is an opioid that um, we actually use for um, patients with chronic diarrhea. Um, so that is going to end up actually being a side effect, though, of constipation for many patients that are on opioids, all right? Um, so you have listed there side effects, many side effects. It's very important that we're monitoring patient. And then we have adverse effects that you're going to be able to look up in your drug books um, to see, you know, that's going to be part of that respiratory depression, us, us making it so the patient's not, you know, their body's not wanting to take as many breaths as they need. And notice here at the bottom that opioids taken with kava, uh, valerian, St. John's wort may increase sedation. So I need to be asking about those um, herbal supplements that patients are taking. So morphine, that's a big one that you're going to end up using. You'll find that on page 359. You want to definitely look into the side effects, adverse reactions. Um, it's an extract from opium. Um, and it's very potent. It's effective in relieving severe pain, but also causes respiratory depression, hypotension. You can read all that. I don't need to read it to you. Um, it's going to, you know, if it's given PO, it undergoes the first hepatic pass, um, but a lot of times this is given IV, so it's not going to go through that, so the patient's going to get the full dose. Um, patients, many patients have a lot of problems with nausea and vomiting with this, so many times it's going to be followed up with some IV Zofran or something of that nature um, because it's just, it's a powerful um, opioid. So controlled substance that are strictly regulated, so we have these different um, schedules that are, that we have um, different medications on, so I've listed these out for you, the schedules, um, so obviously a schedule one, these are medications that you cannot get, although you know things have changed with marijuana and, and medical marijuana cards, um, but schedule ones are things like heroin and LSD, okay? You can see that with the Schedule 2s, the Schedule 3, Schedule 4, Schedule 5, um, the different things that are in there, uh, you know, this is how well they're regulated. And when we get to mental health, I will also teach you guys about MAPS, which um, is a system we have here in Mis Michigan for being able to pull every scheduled med that a patient has filled in whatever time period we choose to check. So, um, and I'll be able to actually show you guys those when we, when we go down to Brighton or in class. Um, if I don't end up taking you guys all to Brighton. So, <clears throat> Demerol is actually one of the first synthetic opioids. Um, it's primarily effective in GI procedures. Uh, you can read through all of this stuff. It is actually preferred to morphine during pregnancy um, because the neonate does not have as much respiratory depression as they do if the mother had morphine. Um, we need to use caution with older adults. That's with all opioids though, to be honest with you. Um, it's not for long-term use, and that will be one that eventually you are going to need to make, will not be on the test. Um, morphine, you will see. Hydromorph hydromorphone, which is Dilaudid, you will also see. This is so powerful. It is, um, and a lot of times I will say it's very similar to heroin, okay? It's very, um, it's very, the, the way people feel on it and the makeup of it and everything. Um, is very similar to what people that use heroin are feeling. So um, there's a big withdrawal that can happen for patients that are on it long term. You definitely want to look this up in your drug book and put this under your opioids. Um, you know, there's, it's going to be very similar though with like your morphine. So your morphine, your hydromorphone, all these can be included together. They pretty much all have the same kind of um, side effects and action and all of that stuff. So there's more information here on this for you and you can get all of that out of your book. There's combo drugs, combo medications that we use, um, combinations of NSAIDs and opioids. You'll also see, um, so that's like a Vicoprofen, okay? That's hydrocodone and ibuprofen. Um, you guys also know like Norco, that's gonna be um, hydrocodone and acetaminophen. Um, we also have Tylenol-3, which is acetaminophen and codeine. So we use PCA pumps very often in the hospital for our patients. This allows them to get a dose all the time. Um, so we talked about basal doses the other day in class. So the basal dose is the dose that continues, whatever the doc sets it for. And then um, we have where the patient can push the button to control that. Only the patient is supposed to push that button. The nurse is never supposed to push that button for the patient. 
um, when they're asleep and the family is also supposed to be taught not to administer that to the patient when they're asleep. Um, it's only the patient that we're going to teach to have to push that push that button, okay? Um, then it's going to give them a certain amount of dose. But there's also a lockout time set for everybody uh, that will make it so they can't end up overdosing themselves. So you've got you've got your example here of a PCA order. You can read through that. These are going to be posted as soon as I finish this recording, so you'll be able to go through this as well on your own. Um, we also have transdermal patches, so um, fentanyl is the most common one. It delivers around the clock pain control for the patient. Remember that with a transdermal patch, we never cut it uh, because then I have no idea what kind of dose the patient is getting. I also do not um, use or touch transdermal patches with my bare hands. I'm going to put gloves on every single time. Um, and then you can read about transdermal patches in your book, but I've given you the primary um, things that I really want you to know for me for this. Um, the whole the kids thing I just put in there just for your information. You're not going to need that for right now. Same thing with the oncology patients. We'll get to that when we get into um, different cancers and stuff. Um, individuals with a history of substance abuse. So opiates are safe and effective, but they may need larger doses or greater frequency. But we need to be really, really careful, okay? Um, the patient knows themselves the best and we really do need to listen to them and if they tell us no I, I can't then we need to listen to them okay um, and I've obviously learned that more and more I work in the addiction area um, that patients will be talked into actually using medications that they were not comfortable and um, it ends up triggering their addiction again so we've got to use a lot of caution um, and when we do know we have a patient with addiction history that we, um, you know, have that they must have pain medications that are addictive, then that we help with teaching of both them and the family with administration and all of that, but we'll get into that later. Um, pain scales, so you've got your um, different things um, over here on the left. You'll see this is for a patient that um, cannot communicate, and then you have the Wong Baker Faces pain scale over here. Um, and then, you know, we can use that with kids and adults, and then we have our, our 0 to 10, you know, 0 being no pain at all, 10 being the worst pain in the world. Um, and, you know, again, pain is subjective to the patient. What they tell me their pain is what their pain is. So other things that we can use, um, primarily, you know, you'll see that there's different analgesics and it's listed here for you, but also what's very important is, um, you know, the non-medication therapies that we can use for patients that we want to make sure that we teach them about relaxation and deep breathing and um, all of those things that, and we'll go into that stuff more, but that the fact is, or the, the point of that is, is that there's other things we can use in conjunction that aren't necessarily going to be um, medications. Ice, heat, massage, um, we could go on and on about the different things, you know, distraction, journaling, um, music therapy, um, Anyway, we'll, we'll keep going. We'll, we're going to keep moving because I see I'm running out of time. Um, so opioid antagonist, this is going to um, initially it was made to decrease opioid abuse. There's these different medications here for you, but they also do have high abuse. I'm not going to ask you for this one, but you will see these eventually. Not nearly as much, though, as you're going to see the other ones that we already talked about. Down here, you want to see... Um, that some opioid antagonists used for um, overdoses like Narcan, uh, Revia, these are Naloxone over here, Narcan. Naloxone is the second ingredient in Suboxone. So we'll talk more of that come um, next term. The big thing to know about that is if you have a patient come in with an overdose of some kind of opioid overdose, that if I give them Narcan, I'm going to send them into instant withdrawal. They are going to be a very unhappy person, but they're going to be alive. So you definitely want to, um, you know, have a Narcan card or an uh, antagonist card made um, from your from your book. You can read about migraine and cluster headaches. Um, you can read about that stuff right in your book. I'm not going to ask you on this stuff for this test um, with any of the migraine or the cluster headaches. Um, or the medications, but you are going to need those. Everything that we've gone through is that start. So be sure that you're working on drug cards when um, I know in your spare time. So, okay, that's it. Let me know if you have any questions.